ask you to introduce yourself. I'm going to ask you about the you want to do with your journey. Yeah. I've got questions to ask you about working for Prospect Magazine. So careful what you say. So. <laughs> <laughs> Other magazines are available. I'm not really editor in the world, I mean, maybe I can work with you. Very good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to make a, a start now. It's five past. I don't wanna, I've got a lot to get through, and I don't want it to be too late. Um, so, hello, um, my name is Will Crook, and I'm the PLS uh, Policy and Communications Manager. It's an honor and a pleasure to welcome you all to this year's much anticipated policy panel. It's been uh, talked about in the previous sessions. Uh, some of you may remember that last year's policy panel uh, was held the day before Boris Johnson resigned as Prime Minister. Okay? <laughs> Those two events were completely unrelated, okay? <laughs> just for the record. Um, so I hope, um, so there will be questions towards the end. We'll have a, a short segment for that. So I hope it will give you some time to think of some and we get some raised hands. Now, for anybody watching events in Westminster from afar over the past year, I think a perfectly understandable question would be, what on earth has been going on? Uh, well, to answer that question, I've invited two very special guests, two experts from two superb organisations, both of which PLS are proud members of. Uh, now, both panellists work on policy issues in Westminster on behalf of not only publishing, uh, but the UK's creative industries more broadly. Uh, so, as they're slightly outside the pol uh, publishing ambit, I will introduce them more fully. Um, we have, on the end, uh, Saskia Periad abdo who is the Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the British Copyright Council. The BCC, as it's more commonly known, is a non-profit organisation that represents the copyright community in Westminster and further afield, and promotes the education and understanding of copyright, copyright more broadly. Now, Saskia, my first question to you. I believe you have some experience of the publishing world and used to work for Prospect Magazine. Yeah, actually, I have to... And first of all, can everybody hear me at the back? If not, please shout or raise your hand. Now. Try to project more. Okay. Oh, there we are. <laughs> okay. Um, so, no, actually, I have the publishing industry to thank for my career because um, for those of you who pay attention to political magazines, there are really three in Westminster. There is The Spectator, there's the New Statesman, and then there's Prospect, which was the little unknown gem in, that I'd like to argue with everybody in a slightly academic way. And I had an editor call me out of the blue after she'd met me um, as I was finishing my master's degree. She was lovely enough to give me a job, and then kinder, perhaps, to then quit two weeks later, <laughs> which then gave me about a year at Prospect to kind of created my little niche in the public affairs, corporate lobbying world, before a new editor came in one day and asked, what are you actually doing? <laughs> um, which at that point, me as a 23-year-old had to explain, well, this is, I really think the magazine should have a lobbying function, and I think I should do it. And this is what's taken me here about 10 years later. Lovely. Well, so thank you very much to the publishing industry. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, we have Dan Guthrie, too, uh, who is Director General at the Alliance for Intellectual Property. The Alliance represents a range of sectors, including IP-rich businesses and creators, from the Premier League to the BPI. And this year, is the, Alli the Alliance celebrates 25 years of, uh, of service. And Dan, how will you be celebrating that? So we have um, a reception um, next week uh, on the terrace, which is probably in its 18th uh, year. So we will be... Uh, showing people some how John Whittingdale has changed over the 20 years uh, uh, and other members of the Alliance and industry members and how their haircuts are including uh, uh, Andrew Yates in the audience. Uh, we've got some very good photos coming back for 20 years. And then later in the year we're hoping to have a separate reception for uh, all the former intellectual property ministers that have been during those 25 years, which will mean a room larger than this to fit them in, um, which perhaps we'll get onto a little bit. I think, I think we are, yes. Um, okay, excellent. Um, well, thank you, Robert. We do have a lot to cover, as you said. Now, with uh, number 10 uh, seemingly installing a revolving door from June to October last year, and almost monthly changes to government, it's a bit of a difficult place, uh, difficult to kind of find a place to start. Um, so let's look at first at the departmental changes made by Rishi Sunak earlier this year. 
after he was installed as Prime Minister, and namely the breaking up of Bayes, uh, well, Bennett <laughs> Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and the creation of the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, or DSIT as it's generally called. Now, the government has also moved responsibility for digital policy from the Culture, Media and Sport Department to this new department. Um, so there's legislation that might affect publishers such as the Online Safety Bill and the Digital Markets Bill that has been is now overseen by DSIT. Um, the IPO, the Intellectual Property Office, has also moved into this newly created department. And DSIT will also be the home of the new IP minister, uh, the, the, the new new one, um, Viscount Camrose who was given the newly created ministerial role of Minister for AI and IP. So obviously we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, now Saskia, my first question to you. Considering all the difficulties that, create, that creating a, or, or merging departments um, brings, why did the government create a new science department? Well, I think first and foremost, it's really important to note that no new prime minister inherits a government without changing a department or two. Um, Bayes, which is what DSIT has replaced, was in it itself a new department that was created in 2017. So it's not new, it happens every administration, sometimes it happens multiple times across the course of one administration. Um, however, why would you take the opportunity to basically reshuffle the, chair, the, the, the deck chairs, for lack of a better word, and basically create a new department here, and why would you focus it on science? And the answer is, Bayes, from its very inception, was a very bloated department that had a lot of structural challenges. It was meant to cover business, it was meant to cover energy, and it was meant to resurrect the whole idea of an industrial strategy. Those are three really broad, really big portfolios that it had inherited from separate departments. And there were a lot of good things that Bayes did, let's be clear, there were a lot of good successes. Having an integrated approach on certain things would have probably given it much more successes had it had a higher chance in a longer term as a department. At the end of the day, it was only around for five years. But it always had a bit of an issue with the fact that it was a foundational department, but a lot of the strategy was actually held in other places. So for example, a base minister that would be responsible for university innovation would often have to share their brief education as well. Um, somebody who was in charge of um, energy would also often be a junior minister who was responsible for being part of the Department for International Trade. So when you have a lot of junior ministerial roles who are accountable to two different secretaries of state, it does get become a bit of a challenge. So creating a new government department, focusing on science, which was really an underpinning factor during the pandemic, made a lot of strategic sense. Um, bring copyright, in my opinion, along with trademarks and patents, which is where the IPO sits. Again, sitting under the science department makes a lot of sense as well. I will quickly note before I finish that answer that there were some questions when the announcement was originally made. We weren't sure where the IPO was actually going to lie. There was always going to be a possibility it was actually going to sit under the Department for Business and International Trade. So there's always those bigger, broader questions of when you have this new headline department, where does the actual infrastructure of government and departments that sustain it, where does that go? And I'm personally glad it has stayed with science, but we're still very much in the process of working out the kinks and figuring out where the information flows are going and also where the staffing themselves are going. I mean, as an example, I'm still corresponding with people who have the old Bayes email address, mm -hmm. and I likely will be doing so for the next six months or so. It's quite normal. Yeah, quite, quite disruptive. De department changes and mergers it does take a long time. Um, Dan, uh, with, with the removal of digital from the culture, media, and sport department, uh, is, that, uh, is that of any big significance? Is that an area of concern for us in the creative industries? I don't think so. Uh, I think what has been interesting since the changes is that when um, DCMS also had responsible for digital, uh, digital and technology policy, it always had to strike a kind of balance or what it perceived as a balance between the two. And I don't want to overstate that kind of division because most creative businesses are also tech businesses and digital businesses these days. What I have found since it's moved is that DCMS feels uh, unencumbered and it is much more willing to go into bat for the creative industries. And so although it's a smaller department, it is, it is a more vocal department on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a couple of very specific examples of that in uh, in the last few months. So actually, I think, um, I think in some ways it's, it's been better. And we actually have three, vol three departments now because trade policy sits within the Department for Business, so we have to have good dialogue with, with them. We've got DCMS really going to bat for us. And we've got 
DCIT where implementing things like the digital markets uh, legislation, which was actually formally came out of DCMS. And I don't see any great change in their approach to that or like big tech is somehow they're going to be willing to water that legislation down. So I don't, so far, actually, I can only see root positives. Good, excellent. Uh, and now kind of touching upon the new IP minister, um, have any of you met the new IP minister yet? Um, and do we know why the government have created this AI IP ministerial role? So I, I have met him on a couple of occasions, um, uh, Jonathan Berry, uh, Viscount Camrose. Um, he had a strong interest in AI, so that was why he wanted to take that particular policy area. Uh, and then I think the honest answer is then they were looking at where the other responsibilities and everyone else had a lot, like, you know, uh, had science and, and others, and Paul Scully's got tech, so he was given IP. The issue that uh, Jonathan Berry, Viscount Camrose, has is that he only joined the House of Lords this time last year. Uh, as a hereditary elected hereditary peer. So he's actually only been a politician for a year. Um, and he's only, this is his first ministerial role. So he's on a very steep learning curve and has to take the data bill and other legislation through uh, the House of Lords. And he's never spoken at the dispatch box until this point. He'd only spoken in the House twice before becoming a minister. So he's very, um, he has very good qualities. He uh, has a business background, understands the issues. If I have a concern, it's that he's not, he's very ex inexperienced at the politics. Yeah, well, um, well, that's something obviously to look out for over the uh, next year or so. Um, so obviously we've touched upon it once, it's been touched upon many times um, during the conference and it will do into the, uh, the keynote speech, AI. Um, now, obviously, the creation of a new AI IP <coughs> minister is certainly interesting and reflects the way AI has become the issue of the moment. Um, Saskia, the government has recently published its AI white paper. What do you think of the government's general approach uh, to AI, AI regulation? Uh, does it touch upon copyright in any way? I'm going to get ahead to the end by saying not as much as it should, to be quite frank. Um, when we first started grappling uh, as a council and our members looked at AI, and a lot of them, let's be clear, that we're talking about it from a policy perspective, not from a business practice perspective. A lot of members have been working with AI models, have developed their own AI models for years. So it's not a question of one or the other. I think, as Dan said, many companies and many firms in the creative sector are also tech firms. Um, so it's not a zero-sum game here. But from a policy perspective, when we first started looking at policy questions surrounding AI, it, it did feel as if we were a bit ahead of the curve because we were posing questions before we even knew what the government's question was going to be, right? And now we're at a stage where the questions are finally being posed and they're being put forward in a white paper which is based on very, very vague, they're not wrong per se, but they are vague and it's not clear how they're gonna be implemented principles. And just so everybody knows, those principles are safety, transparency, fairness, accountability, and contestability. Now, as headline principles, there is nothing wrong with them, but the question does become, and this is where our response to the white paper, and I know many people in this room have responded accordingly as well, how does this actually work in practice? And how is that gonna impact emerging business models on both sides of the equation? And it also touches on to much broader issues, which are linked to regulation and enforcement. Um, we have a very big challenge here, and it's a shame that at this stage, those really big technical questions are absent in the white paper. Now, don't get me wrong, they're not absent in our responses to a white paper, and I'm sure they'll have to be taken into account in future rounds of negotiation and conversation. But one really fun exercise I do whenever there is a policy paper or statement or speech that really should have something to do with copyright is, it's a very quick, central, alt find, look for the word copyright. In the white paper, it only appeared once at the very bottom of the page, saying the document itself was a copyrighted material <laughs> of the government. And that right there is, in my opinion, the problem. It, I have nothing against those principles. Those principles are good principles. They are something that should underpin our conversations. They are cross-sectoral principles that we can work with. But 
if you don't have copyright as the foundation of these conversations, underpinning how this is going to be developed across multiple different sectors facing very different challenges and opportunities, you are missing a trick here and you're not going to be creating, in my opinion, a system that's fit for purpose moving forward. Um, I, I think, Dan, I kind of want to ask you, I think we, we got a, a taste from Saskia what the BCC was saying in their response. Um, was your response, the Alliance's response, similar to that? What were the key messages for you uh, to send to the government? So, so ye yes, it was. The, the other part of the white paper is, is that it, it intends that existing regulators deal with the AI issues that arise uh, without creating a new AI regulator. So privacy issues in AI will be dealt with by the Information Commissioner's Office. If there are issues about how AI is used in financial services, the Financial Conduct Authority, or competition, the Competition Markets Authority. And so it, it looks at it from a statutory regulatory point of view. The issue with IP is that we don't have a statutory regulator. We have the Intellectual Property Office, which provides guidance and policy advice to the government on our IP framework, but has no statutory enforcement powers. So if we have a IP issue with AI, we can't go to the IPO and say, take enforcement action, they're breaking the law here. And so we don't have that same model. And that is hugely missing in the white paper. And as Saskia says, it is also, IP is a horizontal rather than vertical issue because it crosses all uh, potential sectors from healthcare through to environmental through to the creative industries. And therefore, th there is a huge gap that the white paper doesn't deal with. So our question to government is, how are you going to deal with the, the natural issues that are going to arise with, between the IP framework and the AI uh, and AI development. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you. And it's been, I, I've kind of found it interesting uh, over the last few weeks, maybe months, um, yesterday, the Prime Minister and the Liaison Committee, um, some of the words, uh, that, well, some of the phrases he was using, um, and also you have this international AI conference coming up uh, after the summer, kind of perhaps indicates that the government are slightly changing their stance on this, um, not just maybe at the hands, hands um, kind of laissez-faire, hands-off approach that the, I think a lot of the press have been um, commenting upon. Saskia, do you get any indication that this might be changing since the white paper has been published? I wouldn't say it's necessarily changing since the white paper has been published. I think this is a process that's already been in development for quite a while. I mean, unfortunately, and this is why I do have a lot of sympathy with civil servants, it takes so long to create a consultation response that it takes about 20 minutes to write a speech for a minister for number 10. So there is always going to be a bit of a headline chasing approach to policy making when you are seeing AI, in this case, potentially becoming a competitive advantage for the country nationally. Now, what I would say to answer your question directly, though, is there is more awareness that getting this right is not an option. You actually are going to be potentially undermining a really big sector of the UK economy. You also have a big challenge here, which I'm probably bringing too many of the geopolitics here. You have a prime minister who has decided to make AI their pet project, for lack of a better word. It is now one of the key principles and one of the proactive areas of policy making that's always present in every single speech. Um, and that is putting a prime minister in a rather difficult position because you're putting the UK regulatory framework, whatever shape it's gonna be emerging in, in direct competition to the EU's and the US, who are both working on very, very different sets of principles. Um, and there's a question here which is very different, has nothing to do with copyright, let's be clear. My challenge here is to make sure that whatever framework we work with doesn't undermine and infringe on a copyright system which does work and actually offers a lot of value for the UK economy. But from a political perspective, you have a very big challenge here of getting this right tonally, not undermining the economy, but also making sure you try to grab some good positive headlines because let's face it, there are not many good positive headlines at the moment. Um, and every prime minister does have a mission, for lack of a better word. We used to have leveling up. We had getting Brexit done. We had making an industrial strategy work. We now have using AI to unlock the country's innovation, innovation pipeline. How do you get that headline into actual practical policy terms when all of a sudden the world is watching? Is now, I think, where the government is facing. 
whereas before you could do a lot of that work below the surface. Yeah, and Dan Conway mentioned it uh, in the CEO's panel about the kind of global regulate, you know, tying this up across the world, not just with the EU and US, but uh, across the world. That, that's quite important too. I mean, maybe the pennies dropped with government there on, on that too, do you think? Yeah, and I think it's also a bit of a challenge. I'm not going to go too much to the EU because I'm sure there's quite a few EU experts here yeah. in the room, and I know better than to try to claim expertise in something I have a passing um, knowledge about, but the EU is much more in advance. It has progressed their conversations on these issues because they've been dealing and grappling with them among the member states for a really long time. So if all of a sudden the UK as a country wants to say, actually, we're the forefront leader, they do have some ground to catch up on, and that's quite a challenge. Yeah, yeah and I think that's actually mirrored across a lot of policy areas where we're, we're kind of playing catch up. Uh, okay, well, I want to focus on the relationship even more, on relationship between AI and copyright. Many here will be aware that last year uh, the government proposed a new and extremely broad copyright exception for text and data mining, which vastly widened the current uh, non-commercial exception. And the, com the new com exception would have allowed for text and data mining for any reason without the ability for a rights holder to opt out and, and without the need for the AI company to obtain a license, uh, even if that TDM or um, computational analysis was being done for com commercial purposes. Now, this choice would obviously fundamentally weaken the copyright framework and have a detrimental effect on publishing and the creative industries as a whole. Uh, now, after a period of sustained pressure from the creative industries, um, in February this year, the government U-turned and decided to drop their plans. Um, now, looking back with a certain amount of hindsight, I guess, uh, Saskia, I'm going to come back to you now. What were the main reasons behind the government's decision to uh, U-turn on this? I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, and, and I would say the first was I think there was a surprise by how vehement and also consistent the reaction from rights holders across different creative sectors, but also all parts of the copyright ecosystem was actually, um, very, they were very vocal, they were very consistent, they were also all aligned. Um, there is often when a decision is potentially unpopular, an understandable strategy is try to do a bit of a divide and conquer. Um, that did not happen here, partly because members spoke to one another, but different creative sectors held the line. Um, we had meetings where visual artists would actually ensure that they weren't giving ground that would actually hurt performers. We would have meetings where publishers would hold the ground because they knew this would actually hurt authors. So having the creative and rights holders being really aligned on what actually could look like, and quite frankly, how option four was not good. Um, was quite helpful because there were no chinks in the armor and there were no chinks in the argument. I think the second component is that there was, quite frankly, no evidence to justify the IPO's initial decision to go for a broad exception. Um, so I will spare you the details, but we did break down about 88 consultation responses. We did code them. We did make sure we knew which every player who had responded had said, including from the tech and AI sector. And normally, when you do a consultation, there has to be a very clear golden thread between the evidence, the scenarios, and then the decision that's proposed. And in this case, there wasn't. So when you don't have the evidence to support the decision, you have very clear opposition that's consistent from the creative sector and the rights holders that eventually attracts political attention, you eventually do have to U-turn, which is exactly what happened in about six to seven months. Excellent. Now, to bring everybody up to speed at the moment, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, anyway, the government is currently working on producing a, co a voluntary code of practice uh, between rights holders and AI, AI companies on the use of copyright material in AI. Uh, now, Dan, what would you like to see in that code of practice? So I think the other thing, just to go back to what Saskia was saying, I also th think that ministers had no idea of what they'd approved as a policy. <laughs> uh, and then, and which is, you know, slightly shocking, but I think you talked earlier about the instability in the political system last year. I don't think that the IPO briefed them well enough of the likely reaction to what this decision meant. Uh, and I think once the those ministers realised the errors of their ways. Uh, I think they always say, you know, every failure is an orphan uh, and every success has a thousand parents. And this was definitely the orphan. And to the extent that the minister even forgot that he'd, or claimed that he hadn't made the decision. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, it's a sad indictment of how much they read the policy papers that they're approving. But I think that was a, a genuine part of that. 
to then move on to these codes of, codes of practice. You know, we've been told, and Saskia has mentioned it for the last 18 months, that the problem of AI and copyright is that we weren't licensing enough. And we disagreed with that. You know, where's the evidence? Uh, and so this kind of code of practice roundtable process was supposed to tease these out. So imagine our surprise that at the first meeting, the large language models, foundation models, then told us, actually, and it was under Chatham House rules, so I can't say which ones, but I can actually, under Chatham House, uh, on a non-attributive ba attributive basis, they basically said, we don't think we need to seek your permission, and we don't think we need to seek licenses. So we're supposed to be sitting, negotiating, talk, not negotiating, but talking about licensing with a load of people who are now saying, we don't think we need to license. So the first thing that should go into any code of practice is the general principle, well, not general, but very specific principle, that if AI developers want to use our, your content, they need to seek permission uh, and they need to seek licenses. Just full stop. And that's, that's what we'd like to see. Yes, we'd like to see transparency. We'd like to see metadata not being stripped. And we'd like to see labeling and all those things. But at the very principle, if you're using our content to make billions of pounds, you should be paying for us. Here, here to borrow a phrase. And uh, Saskia, could you give us a sense, perhaps, of how the meetings have gone generally? I mean, <laughs> that, that aside, <laughs> obviously, perhaps not, not brilliantly. But where, where are the areas that actually there has been some agreement, perhaps, and where we are kind of? There has been some agreement on the fact that there is a problem. <laughs> um, however, that, what I, however, what I will say, um, and again, keeping to Chatham House rule, um, and there should be some um, announcements from the IPO about the progress of the roundtables and the next steps over the coming weeks. Um, what I will say is that it actually has been very, very useful to bring different parties to the table and actually hear from them directly where they see the failures or the barriers or the lack of failures in many cases. And it actually has really helped, at the very least, I'll speak for myself, it, it has helped strengthen what we had as implicit arguments or ideas. We now know, no, this is no longer a guess. We know exactly that this is the principle and the assumptions they are using to build their own business models. And it does mean on one side it's a reinforcement that we were on the right track. We weren't just creating shadows out of nowhere. Um, I would also say that fr fr basically friction is a necessary part of any negotiation. But when you have certain actors who ha come in with very clear principles and then don't really stand up to screw near some very, very direct questions like, out of curiosity, have you ever tried to procure a license? That gives us something to work with moving forward. And I think it's also really important, and we cannot underestimate how important it is for these conversations to happen in front of policymakers, right? Because ultimately, often these conversations happen behind closed doors or behind, between different business actors, also having policymakers in the room, and eventually we hope elected officials in the room will hopefully help direct the the conclusion to a safer landing pad than where we've landed in the past, let's put it this way. But I am leaning towards more optimism at this point um, until I am given more data otherwise. <laughs> but for now, I'm still optimistic, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> so, I, I, Dan, in, in the medium, perhaps foreseeable future, has the threat of a new exception gone away, or is it still there? No, whilst those large language models are ingesting all our data and trying to find ways of avoiding paying for it and seeking permission, no, the threat hasn't gone away because that's their solution. Their solution is to change the law to allow them to scrape all this data without seeking permission. So the threat hasn't gone away. Uh, I don't think there is any, any great political appetite to support that, however, so I don't think there's a, a huge political threat. And in some ways, having flushed out those large language models, uh, I think the government feels, or certain parts of it feel, that they were hoodwinked. Uh, and that those models were telling them it was all because they couldn't seek licensing, and now it turns out that they're not. And our message is very clear to the, to the government, is that they need to restate the very basic principles that you know, AI firms 
uh, need to seek permission and, and need to license. And the, the way I'm describing it is that they need to stop acting like Napster and start acting like Spotify. Uh, and that's the message I'm giving to politicians uh, and, and Osaskia is, um, you know, uh, and others. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it might, I think, uh, speaking to you both as well, it, it might just be worth pointing out, there are actually AI co companies in the room who do license and who yep. oh, are happy to do so too. I, I, and I absolutely, th th those voices were also very clear yeah. in, in the round tables and, and were very critical um, and, and said, you know, absolutely to that point. And we need as, uh, as right holders to work with those firms because they, they are going to be put at a competitive disadvantage mm -hmm. if the person in the office next door isn't doing the right thing. So we're absolutely not saying it is those large language models at the moment that, yeah. that seem to be the, the, the biggest uh, concern. Excellent. And sorry, Will, but just to also quickly add, we've been talking about the IPO, we've been talking about government, but we also have to be aware that the issue is gaining prominence within the Labour Party as well. We had um, the Labour front bench, Shadow Secretary of State, coming out publicly, I believe it would be last month, actually pushing for licensing. Now, so there is also that bit of that challenge here of saying, if government doesn't get it right, you, you do have an opposition who is also keen on making sure it doesn't go wrong. So... Licensing definitely being the way forward, but depending on how and where the conversations go, um, we'll look for allies where they where they show up. Excellent. And um, I mean, we mentioned about how the creative industries have come together on this and kind of been very united. How do we make sure that continues into the again into the foreseeable future whilst this is still a very live issue? I I, I think if we focus on that ingestion issue. Um, and I know there will always be debates as to you know, how money is distributed uh, between creators and producers. Uh, but if there is no money, none of it can be redistributed. Uh, and so I think to, to focus on that and talking to a whole range of both creator and producer representative bodies, you know, there is total unanimity as there was 12 months ago on the text and data mining. And, and that message is getting through with ev everyone who is having these meetings is raising this, uh, whether that's yourselves, whether it's the PA, across the creative industries. Um, so, you know, that message, it, you know, is definitely getting through and it's, it is a single voice. But that's what we need to focus on. Let's not, let's not argue about how we distribute monies that we haven't yet received. <laughs> yeah, excellent, good point. Uh, now, uh, kind of moving on, uh, Sassier kind of foreshadowed this, we talked about the Labour Party and the opposition. Now, everybody likes a bit, bit of political speculation, uh, although probably after the last year, it's not such a good idea to do this on stage and filmed as well. Um, but there's going to be a general election coming up, uh, possibly at some point between now and January 2020, 2025. Looking at the polling, it's, it does suggest that Labour are going to do very well. Um, now, what are Labour saying about... I mean, you've, you've mentioned it slightly there, Saskia. Are, are Labour saying anything else about IP? Would a change of government actually make much of a difference in this, do you think? It's always going to be one of that point in the panel where you have to basically ask, well, how long is a piece of string? Um, to be honest, there, whatever a government says or a government in waiting says before they become government can change quite drastically. What I will say, given what we already know about the Labour Party, is unlike the constant churn of IP ministers we've had in government, we've actually had a very stable shadow IP minister over the last couple of years. Um, there is no guarantee that she will retain her brief. Um, but if she does, she, this is an MP, um, Chiwa Nuura, who has actually been interested in the subject for many, many years, um, is also quite interested in patents, is quite interested in IP in general, and at the very least would bring a rather, in my opinion, forensic question-led approach, which would be very welcome. Again, there is no guarantee that she will have that role if there is a Labour government. I would also say that the AI question has galvanized a bit more conversation among the Labour front bench in the conversations I've had, um, which are conversations that are happening now that weren't happening two years ago, from my perspective. Um, we do have Lucy Powell, who is actually very interested in AI. Again, where that's going to go is debatable, but if she retains her brief, that should be interesting and should give at least a bit of stability. But again, I'll be honest, Will, it very much is a who knows at this stage. And I, and I wouldn't be confident giving any predictions beyond saying these are the players right now. And if they do remain the players next year, this is how knowledgeable they are 
taking on new ministerial briefs. And is, is that you agree with that, Dan? Is, is there? I, th I think we're, we're we're still a very long way out to to think we're going to get detailed kind of what they might do around IP. I think the, maybe the best way to say it, I don't get any sense that there's going to be a radical change of approach to um, the copyright framework, do some huge review, have some big new piece of you know, copyright legislation. So I, I don't think we'll see any major radical change. I agree with Saskia. I think that they may be slightly more interventionist on AI just generally. Um, but also the, the thing about Keir Starmer is uh, he takes quite a long time to make decisions. He's not necessarily an instinctive, this is what I'll do. Um, and so, you know, and I also, not, we're not going to get a manifesto, what I call the Oliver Letwin, kind of 80 pages of what we're going to do on, you know, every single high street and, you know, every single issue. I think it's going to be very broad brush and they're going to give themselves significant freedom. So when you look at that and tie that back, Traditionally, Labour have been very supportive of the creative industries. I don't expect that to change. Uh, I expect them to be slightly more interventionist on, on AI. But I also think that they're not going to do anything radical. And they will have more priorities. And right, right that they will. You know, the, the key thing is don't ask them for any money because they haven't got any. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, uh, good note to end on, I guess. Um, now, uh, we've got, I'm conscious of time, got a few minutes for questions. Uh, if we have some quick questions, that would be great. Is there anybody who wants to go first? Or have we explained everything completely? Gentlemen at the front there. Thank you. After Brexit, where are we now? and complain with the European Union copyright. Uh, what's the difference? Yeah, so we're kind of now uh, Brexit, what's the... Uh... So the rule bill. Yeah. So the rule bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a great question. Um, that could take a whole other session about the ups and downs uh, uh, of that one. Um, however, to answer your question, from my perspective, um, there was a lot more worry about departure from the EU copyright framework and things that we'd done that would actually have a huge impact on the UK. Um, I know the IPO did a mapping exercise, um, the BCC did as well. Uh, I would be highly surprised if the Alliance didn't. Um, and we did isolate a few areas of concern at the beginning of the year. Uh, we were in constant conversation dialogue with the IPO who had actually thankfully identified the same. We're now at the tail end of the process, and it, it does seem like a lot of the changes are much more crossing T's, dotting I's, rather than significant, substantial changes. So there might be some nuances here that might affect certain sectors, but we're not seeing anything too drastic to worry about at the moment. With the caveat that, as always, these things could change, but right now, things are pretty stable. We, there's not too much to worry about. Dan, Brexit, 30 seconds. I, I think um, there hasn't been great divergence. Don't expect there to be. That there have been some changes which we haven't incorporated into UK law. Um, going back to AI, I actually think the EU and Saskia referenced it. So they actually have a law that's currently going through their legislative scrutiny process, which, if uh, enacted as currently stands, would prevent the kind of activities that we were talking about earlier from those large language models, uh, and that would be hugely beneficial to the UK. So we're actually, to an extent, uh, we'll be beneficiaries of whatever the EU do in their AI Act just by want of those large language models aren't going to be able to provide a UK service and a different service into the EU. And if they can't do it in the EU, they won't be able to provide it in the UK. So actually, in some ways, the EU is being very helpful to us, uh, even though we're not uh, now members. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, I think we're going to have to draw, draw it to a close. I'd just like to point out, I think we have Ailey Wilson from the PPA. Is she in the audience over there? And we have Leslie Landsman. Um, who's the chair of the Alps Policy Committee. I should say, sorry, Ailey is the Policy and Public Affairs Manager at the PPA. Obviously, uh, myself, Dan and Saskia, if we see us around at the drinks reception later, do ask us questions then. Although if it's about AI, please top up our glass first. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
they're, they're all policy experts doing a lot on different policy issues and uh, they're doing a fantastic job for their trade associations and the creative industries. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to Saskia and Dan for their time today and for the great work they do. I, I hope you found our panel interesting and perhaps we've made what's been happening in Westminster a little bit clearer at least. Um, please do sit, sit tight for our keynote speaker, Dominic Young, who will be starting just as soon as we can clear the stage. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you.